My name is Peter Saxton. Uh, I'm crowd hailer all over the internet, so that's GitHub and Twitter, if you want to get in touch. Uh, my employment statement, uh, status is currently nil, so that's, uh, that's fun. Uh, so racks and racks kit are what I want to talk about today. Now, I've been kind of like blogging about them for a while, so uh, show of hands, has anyone heard of racks before? All right, just three, okay. And uh, well, racks kit will be three or less, so maybe I don't need to ask that. Uh, Right, so I have a tendency to uh, talk too quickly, so if I'm doing that, you're allowed to throw things at me. This is my be calm pebble, just says slow down, so we've got that out of the way. Um, right, so I wanted to do this from the beginning and not have any smoke and mirrors. Uh, this is a really awkward height, so we'll see how far through we get with this. Um, but, so Rack's kit is just a, a toolkit for building uh, web, web applications. So I have over here a terminal, so if I do, uh, Mix, racks, new, oh, I was going to do questions. Now, how good is the internet? Hmm, less good than it was when I tested it just moments before. That's what we've learned here. <laughs> this could be the best piece of live coding I've ever done. Oh, uh, okay, cool. CD. And then follow the instructions. So we're just uh, building the, the standard, uh, standard project. Uh, it says here that we've started on port 8080. So we can uh, zoom over, open, over, open up localhost 8080. And we have, you know, sort of arbitrary amount of CSS for a hello page. I can do, say my name is Stockholm, which is, would be an odd name, but it does allow me to say hello Stockholm. Um, and so this uh, demo project has got a couple of things set up. So we've got a flash message at the top. So refresh that page. So Stockholm is in the session. Uh, all the things you kind of expect when getting started with one of these uh, helpful toolkits. So I think that's enough of that for right now. Uh, we'll come back to this a bit more if we've got time at the end. So I need to go back to this page. So. All right, so this is the, uh, the mix file uh, of the thing I just made. Um, and it's got a whole, a whole host of dependencies. So you'll notice, actually, that there isn't a dependency called racks. Um, and there's racks logger, racks view, racks static, racks session, but there's no, there's no racks library. Well, there is, but it's not here. So what is racks? So racks, uh, first things first, racks is stable. Uh, it's no longer just sort of a toy, uh, a toy alternative. Uh, I've actually been using it in production since 2017. Um, it's uh, released, so 1.0 is out, and um, the talk next door right now is about a project called Hoplon, and they're actually, uh, their service is written using Racks as well. So first things first, Racks is an interface. So uh, at the top we have Racks, so this is the simplest uh, uh, website you can make for any request and any config or state, we're going to return with a 200, a 200 response and hello world. So it's just a data structure. Uh, the whole point of Racks is to make it look uh, like you know the Erlang or Elixir idiomatic code. So for contrast, we have a gen server below, and a gen server is just another kind of server. It's in the name. You know, you get a, a message in, which is the request, and you reply with the, some other message, which is the response. Here, they're just useless atoms. That's not very helpful, but the principle is data structure in, data structure out. So here we get dive a little bit deeper. So Rax is an interface. I said that before. Uh, it's actually two interfaces. So if I just go back, in the top one, we were using Rax simple server. So Rax simple server assumes that you can treat your request response cycle as a whole object in and a whole object out. So the request here will actually have the full body, and the response also had the full body. If you need to do more than that, so streaming, either up or down, uh, it also supports that. So you can use, here we've used Rack's uh, server instead of simple server. Um, these are basically just behaviors with one or two helpers. And in this case, we can upload a file. So we have a handle head, handle data, handle tail function. Uh, the handle head uh, function gets called 
as soon as the request headers are uh, read. So that has a body uh, true field if there's body to follow, or a body false if there isn't. Um, but the body is not yet being pulled off the socket. And then every time another packet of data comes in, or another frame if it's HTTP2, uh, the handle data uh, callback is called. And finally, when the um, request finishes, uh, you get this handle tail, which uh, takes all the trailers. Uh, most things don't use trailers, particularly clients, but it is there. So if the request is sending trailers, they will show up at the bottom. And uh, the response, uh, how the response works here is in handle head, handle data, uh, to say that we want to keep this process alive, uh, we return a tuple, and the tuple consists of a list of all the messages we want to send and the new state of our server. So. Uh, in this particular example, we actually, in the last handle tail, send a whole response. We kn by the time we've uploaded this file, we want to send everything back. Um, if there's time, we can have them look a bit further at what you might put in those lists. But this is a good example of the uh, breakdown. So Rax is also a toolkit. So uh, the whole point is to make it easier to make web applications. Like that's the, the whole goal of this project. So instead of having to just deal with the data structure directly, uh, Rax has these functions. So there's get query from a request, passes the query. Uh, there's set header, set body, and there's um, you can build a response just with the status code. So you know, OK, not found. Just makes your code that little bit more legible following through, rather than having to deal with the direct numbers. And finally, and this is the thing that's sort of newest and has come in the last year, uh, Rax is an ecosystem. So because we have a well-specified interface, what a request is, what a response is, and what the behavior is, um, it makes it easier to add things. So here we have, this is just an interesting uh, controller, and uh, we have Rax session, which is one of the libraries I mentioned before. And session allows us to extract a session from a request or embed it into the response uh, with some, some appropriate config. And then Rax view is, um, one of the places sort of like macros are heavily used um, because it's very useful to like do the uh, uh, is it compilation of, a, of an EEX file at compile time. Um, so you get much more efficient and faster uh, response times. So the reason Rax wasn't included in that first mix file uh, is because ACE includes it. So ACE is a server. Um, in the same way for in the uh, Elixir world, uh, Cowboy is the server and Plug is the interface layer. Um, we have Rax as the interface layer, but it can't actually serve HTTP requests. It needs a server to do that uh, for it. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is just what you do for that. So this is just uh, sort of for completeness, because if you just try to use Rax, you won't be able to serve a single, a single page, which would be very disappointing. So what is Rax Kit? So this is what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, where are we? OK. So uh, this is the comparison before. Uh, this is, uh, I wanted to expand this to the, an Erlang comparison, but I don't, think, uh, I don't think the same comparison can be made so easily. So I've stuck with the Elixir one. So at the bottom, you have Cowboy, then you have Plug, and then you have Phoenix. And so the question is, uh, well, the question which I've given the answer to a couple of times is, does Rack's kit fit on the, uh, the third bullet point on the right-hand side? Um, it sort of looks like it should. So with uh, Rax Kit, you have a generator, and you can uh, there's you can manage Node assets. So it'll include Node. Um, all of these compose nicely. So if you use the Docker and the Ecto flag, the database is set up inside Docker, and then Docker Compose file is set up, and then Ecto uses environment variables to find the database. So you can have a uh, you can sort of opt into as much as you want uh, from the uh, the framework or toolkit. And the aim of this is to get you started quickly, same as a framework. And these are all the things that you get. So you get a project structure, you get live reloading, you get templates, you get static assets, um, all of these good things. But all of these, apart from perhaps the project structure, um, build on another library. So for example, live reloading uh, uses a library called Xsync. Uh, the templates are extracted out into Rack's view, which actually can be used inside Plug. There's nothing Rack specific about it, apart from the fact it started in that project. And so in summary, like, I argue that it's not a framework. And it's not a framework for like, a couple of good reasons. Um, I think frameworks have both like, costs and benefits. And uh, I want to talk about some of the like, thinking about what led me to this point. So this is how I've been thinking about things. Uh, 
It's very convenient that they are alliteration because I can call it three C's, but it's a principle that is first seeing the wild today, so maybe I shouldn't get too carried away. So capability is the first one. So capability is the power or ability to do something. So the top one on this list is ACE, which is a server. Like fundamentally, without ACE, you can't serve uh, HTTP requests. And with ACE, you can serve, uh, an, you can make a, a website. It might be awkward, but it, it, it's 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 doable. And the same way you can work directly with Cowboy. Some of them have you know nicer or less nice APIs, but you can you know you can fundamentally do something that you couldn't do before without a certain like non-trivial amount of effort. Like technically, you can always serve websites without a server, but you are essentially just writing your own server. Uh, and then there's another library called EEX HTML, and what that does is it gives you the capability to make templates where you safely escape HTML. So that's, again, something where you can, of course, do it yourself, but you're really best off not doing that. Uh, the next level is convenience. So convenience takes these capabilities and starts bundling them together. Um, so racks is the number one thing sort of for this. Like the fact that there's an interface allows you to use more than one server. Uh, at the moment, there's only one server that uh, that uses the Racks interface, but I've uh, heard from someone in this room that they're going to do Cowboy, so that's that's now in record. Oh, yeah, um, and Session and Viewer are other good examples as well. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, Racks uh, View works with Plug, and fundamentally these are all perfectly useful without generators. So if you go to the Racks README, it doesn't make any mention. Well, it makes a small mention of Racks Kit, but it doesn't say to start using this use the generator. It says, you know, this is where you add it to your supervision tree. And I think it's quite important that it's possible to know everything about the project. And then finally at the top, we have convention. So I really like this quote, so I'm going to read it out loud. So convention is behavior that's considered acceptable or polite to most members of a society. So I think this is actually what a framework gives you, and it is still valuable. Conventions are useful. You know, they help us get work done together. But they only make any sense if you have some kind of group of people who actually you know, believe that they're useful. Um, conventions may not necessarily be making your life as an individual easier at all. Um, sometimes they do, like, you know, it's helpful to like, if you follow conventions through time, then your past self doesn't need to tell you so, your future self so much about what you were thinking on that day. But, you know, fundamentally it has to come from like a group, a group consensus. Right. So where does this lead to? Like, so that, that's sort of what I was thinking about. So the principles of Racks and Racks Kit are as follows. The first one I like is less is more. Uh, so the cheapest, fastest, most reliable components are those that aren't there. This is the exact opposite of batteries included. And the idea is we're sort of optimizing for like, long-term productivity. Like, there's less things in the system that can uh, get out of date as versions update. There's less things that you, know, you, you might only discover later on. Um, it's, yeah. The idea is to save you time, but possibly not time on day one. So the first thing to do less is more is we've removed unnecessary features. Um, so I always think this is an odd slide to uh, sort of show, and that's because what I'm showing you here is the top is the router uh, that used to exist and now simply does not. Um, now, uh, the way to route uh, Rack's requests is to pattern, pattern match. So Elixir and Erlang, pattern matching is incredibly expressive. Um, if you've not seen anything to do with racks before and you're wondering which path might go where, you, you know exactly what's going on. You have nothing extra to learn. And if it doesn't do quite what you want, for example, maybe you want to handle two requests to different uh, authorities in a different way. So you know, you've got two, um, two domains that you're serving the site from and you need to handle them slightly differently. In my routing syntax, you'd have to open a pull request going, maybe we should be able to switch this on authority. And I'm like, oh, that's never going to happen. That's a weird edge case. In the second one, it's it's just another key in the data structure, so you could switch on, you could switch on authority or anything else in that data structure. And yeah, like there's, there's other options. So I've seen people do routing trees and all sorts of things. So you can you can match just on the first element of the path, and then you use pipe and tail. Um, you know everything everything is there. Uh, the only sort of concession I've made is to actually pass the path as a list of segments rather than just a string, because that would be a little bit awkward. Uh, the other principle, delegate as much as possible. So this is um, just a snapshot of the Node ecosystem. Um, see if I can get, well, this will get me the answer I need. Hands up, everyone who loves Node. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, right. That got nearly as many answers as, uh, right. How many people know Racks? Well, okay, I've got some work to do here. Um, so 
the whole point of Node, uh, what I'm showing this, is these tools exist and they are actually very good at what they do. Um, I don't think that, so there isn't a SAS here, so I quite like SAS for CSS, um, but there's no such thing, there is a Node SAS, there's a C SAS, but there's not an Elixir SAS. Like, we might as well use these if we're in the front end. And so, if you use the Node Assets flag in the project, it sets up these two, uh, this is all the code that is added to the Elixir file. Uh, there's, it sets up a package.json and so on and so forth, but how this, uh, how this project deals with node assets is it runs a task. So here we, we start a, um, a child, which is a task. That task has one thing to do, which is to run the command npm run watch.js. And we have another one, which is npm run watch CSS. And at that point, I have sort of abdicated any further responsibility for what I'm going to do. Uh, so the generated project uses uh, Node, SAS, and Rollup to give you a, a starting point. But if you want to use Browserify, I don't know, Elm, whatever else you're doing, as long as it's, you can make a task in NPM, you can just supervise it. So, and I don't want to go any further. Like, this is not, that is not the business of what I'm writing. So it's, uh, it's less code that's in the library. And the final thing here is, and this is, to be honest, perhaps this isn't the biggest point, but I think it's a, it's a good way of sort of, uh, demonstrating the philosophy. So this is the only direct comparison with Phoenix I have. But if you don't want a database uh, with racks, you do a new app. Whereas if you don't want a database with Phoenix, you use dash dash no ecto. And then with a database, it's vice versa. So the idea of uh, opt-in is just about reinforcing like the composability of, uh, of the uh, system. All right, so this is a term. Now this one, this one is a term that I've had uh, as an outing before, and it's definitely going to be a thing. So mind your own business, view controller. Uh, this is the architecture I use all the time uh, when I'm thinking about web stuff. And it's got other names which are like, so, okay, I am curious about this one. Who's heard of hexagonal architecture? Okay, so again, just a few hands. So it's a, it's a term from domain-driven design, and domain-driven design, I think, is one of the most useful things I've ever picked up while I've actually uh, been developing. And it's not in any way language specific. Uh, a lot of the uh, stuff you'll find along online about it is in from an object oriented mindset. But you know, you just need to build a, a little bit of filter um, and it's still very useful content. So the idea here is that my application is some business logic. And around my some business logic, I have ways of accessing uh, that business logic, and I have services that that business logic uh, needs to know. And as much as possible, you don't, you don't want to pollute your business logic with infra infrastructure con concerns. So this was the original uh, model view controller uh, principle, but the, uh, in that model view controller, you had one model and then many views and controllers. And we've sort of lost that with you know, frameworks that have come over time where you have you know, one user model, one user view, and one user controller. That's not really, uh, well, it's not where it started. Like it has its uses. It's a convention that we use. Um, but I prefer to think of it like this. And if you squint, you can sort of see your three-tier architecture. So on the left, we have like an API controller, and then business logic, and then the database. But like in three-tier, you sort of, you make the uh, API controller and the database like unduly important. So how do I sort of reinforce it? Well, okay, here we go. One final thing. So uh, the reason for this uh, is that I say Rack supports all of these architectures. So hexagonal and uh, onion, and there's another name for that, but also event sourcing, which is gaining more popularity. Uh, and that's because it assumes none of them. Like you don't have to, ret you don't have to pull anything out. We have a library that gives you a server. So we you know, each of these modules has a start link function, and each of those start link functions just causes, calls uh, ace start link. And because I haven't decided how the application is going to start, or at least Rax hasn't, Rax Kit gives you a helpful starting place. Um, you can have three endpoints if you want to do it like that. Um, you can start your entire service on demand uh, in a test. So that's what I've done in this bottom one. So most of my tests I actually run like this. Um, so because so much can be run in parallel, I start a full server for every single test. I use a proper HTTP client to call it rather than any helper inside the lot. And it gives me real confidence that I haven't messed up some kind of middleware stack or something on the edge like cores or SSL or one of those things that if you just test inside the controller, you wouldn't be checking. Uh, this makes sure I always am checking it. 
So functional cohesion. Functional cohesion is the best kind of cohesion, if you want the summary. Uh, so functional cohesion is grouping, uh, grouping things by the task that they do rather than what they are. So uh, again, the uh, project structure. So you can change this. There's, there's no, no requirements that you use this. But in the project that's generated, um, I group. So this is uh, login here will be a controller or an action. Um, and then login.html is a template. And I've resisted separating template. There's not a templates directory and a uh, controllers directory, because the action of logging in, both the templates and the controller, they belong next to each other. Like if I'm going to change login or ask another field uh, when I log in, the two files that I'm going to change should be as near as possible to each other. So I take this even further. So, uh, so this is inside that, um, that action. So when I'm routing, I normally route, uh, I mean, you can choose what you do here, but I normally route the same URL, but with different methods to the same action. So here we have um, the, uh, the login action, but it actually deals with both the get and the post. So again, if I need to adjust the login to send an extra field, maybe I'll need to change what I'm rendering, and then maybe I'll need to try to change how I'm, how I'm dealing with it. But again, it's just with the objective of making feature changes have the smallest sort of footprint across your across your project. All right, future plans. So I mean, I can put anything down here, because uh, this is what I do in my free time. But some of the more, in more maybe short term, realistic ones are stability. So now Rax is 1.0. I'm really keen to push stability and sort of some other key things in the ecosystem. So here I've added, um, so this is a, a call for action. Uh, there's 1.0 roadmaps for a couple of the small libraries. Um, and the main thing that's blocking them is uh, some of them, some of them just need other pairs of eyes to like look into it further. Like if I, if I do it 1.0 entirely for my own use case, then, you know, I'm only, only one user. Um, other people are clearly using it, like downloads are going up. I don't know who these people are. If you're one of them, like come and talk to me. That'd be really interesting. But that's, that's like a key priority. Um, better Erlang support. Uh, so it does actually, uh, it does do a macro trick which allows you to write um, Erlang code. Like we, we export all the functions into a, a module that's friendly for uh, calling from Erlang. But I mean, this still requires you use, I think, the appropriate rebar plugin or something because you still have Elixir code in your project. So uh, depending on how much investigating you want to do, like if you're putting it into an Erlang project, it's probably, it, it, there's room for improvement, let's put it that way. Um, I hope to do that improvement, but again, I don't write that much Erlang, so if I do it in isolation, it'll probably just be odd. So new conventions. So the value of this project is uh, to start having some of these conventions we can opt out of. So, So uh, what we have here is nothing that you couldn't do on your own, but it's something I'm considering adding to like the generated project. If you're not sure how to do your validation, this is what I recommend as a first, a first pass. So what I'm using here is so Ecto, which is uh, ostensibly the database library uh, for Elixir, but you can use without a database, so you can just use the validations from it. What I do here is I define that, this, that I have a form module, and so this form module has a Oh, I was going to change these, but yeah, it has a pass token and an item potency key. So one of those is a UID and one of those is a string. And then I have a cast function that takes raw data. And there's a bit of uh, this, this top line, particularly to get the keys, is, um, is a little bit ugly. So, you know, maybe that would be nice to wrap up in a convention. But what it does is it takes a map with uh, string keys and raw data, and it tries to uh, cast it into the uh, struct. Uh, so this um, use ecto schema uh, thing at the top will make a struct for this module. And it will return OK in the struct if everything's good. Or for example, if the, the binary ID is not a valid UID, uh, it'll return an error. So you are, from this point onwards, you're working with checked data. And uh, again, this, this last line is sort of a, uh, a slight appendix from the fact that it used to be from the database, like to apply a change set to do all the validations, you have to apply action. And as far as I'm aware, you can put any key into that thing. Um, it, it does some nice things when you're talking to the database, but we're not. But for some reason, you can't omit it. So you have to, you have to put something in there. Uh, so, OK, so then once you've done that, uh, we can now make our action the simplest thing possible. So we decode like JSON, and then we cast it to a form. And this is, um, 
uh, in DDD terms, this is, well, I think it, I mean, it's an anti-corruption layer is one way of thinking about it. Um, but it's about making your sort of unverified data uh, for the smallest possible amount in your system. And then after this point, you pass it into the business logic, and the business logic has no idea if it came from like, you know, HTTP or you know, has to deal with invalid data. Like, if you're passing in a, a UID or a number, it's a new UID or a number that you expect. And sort of related to this is uh, error handling. So this is a pattern that I put into basically every application I've written. So this is a, bit of a, a little bit of a tour de force of some of my libraries. So, so OK. Uh, is a library that um, treats OK and error tuples. Uh, it provides helpers for working with those. So in this uh, last example, we had uh, the payload and the data. If the, if the body couldn't be decoded, that would crash, because it's not going to match on the OK. Um, and the same if you can't cast it, that would crash as well. So this is not, this is not useful yet, because we don't want to return our users just arbitrary 500s. This one, on the other hand, uh, does quite well. So what we have here is, uh, so in this try do block, uh, the backwards arrow means that it should match on OK something, where the thing on the left ends up inside. So this uh, uh, backwards arrow to uh, payload, as if you want the monad term, it's a bind. So it's binding payload inside something which looks like OK payload. And then the same for the one below. Um, so if both of those uh, successfully bind, and then we will turn the response. So the after block is called if everything matches. And then the rescue block, so if, uh, so if JSON decode returns error reason, then the reason will be passed as this error at the bottom. And we have a standardized place where I'm saying, OK, so what I want to do is for whatever error I get, I want some unified way of dealing them, so I have a format error function at the bottom. Again, this is something that, like, it doesn't need to be, uh, it doesn't need to be a new library. It just, it's just a convention that I find very helpful and sort of working out the best way to, well, if it's useful for everyone or if it's worth casting as sort of like the thing you get started with. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, very easy to read. Um, whether it's specific to my application or more general pattern is sort of the question uh, to be answered. This is a more further down the line. I just wanted to share this, um, this uh, issue. I just liked it as a feature request. Um, someone suggests I add support for Quick. And to help me out, uh, they've linked to the Quick spec. Um, and I've suggested that I would like some help. Um, so it's not happening anytime soon. But uh, if anyone would like to dive into this, it's a, it's a fascinating like uh, protocol. It is not a simple protocol. Um, but again, we should be able to transparently add it underneath. So ACE already does HTTP 1 and HTTP 2, and you don't even know which one you're using most of the time. Uh, it should be possible to just add quick underneath to ACE. And this is the whole convention uh, capability thing. This is just a new capability. It shouldn't change the conventions that we're using. All right, so more buzzwords. So um, this is kind of, I'm, I'm doing, uh, well, I'm, I'm looking at event sourcing, but uh, it's uh, it's more of it's very it's a it's definitely a hobby at this point. Um, the idea of opting in is because I'm not assuming that you're going to have you know a database with views that match your roots. Um, we can opt into something completely different. So it might be the case that I can make a generator which goes, "All oh, right, um, people are using Kubernetes a lot right now." Like, but when you do that, it's really helpful to set up a few extra things in your Docker Compose. Um, you know, how do you want to do config? Like, are all of your um, like config providers? You know, are they going to call into the Kubernetes API stuff like that? Um, are there any useful defaults? So all of these all of these options are essentially: Are there any useful defaults that are worth opting into 90% of the time? So I think, uh, I think GraphQL is probably the most accessible one out of that list. Kubernetes might be the most useful, and event sourcing, I think, would be the most ambitious, but would probably still be, be possible as well. Thank you very much, Peter. It was a very good talk. Questions? Yeah, could you mention anything about sockets? Uh, Ace doesn't actually support web sockets at the moment. There is a method behind this, which is uh, for real time, so the demo, which I started but decided not to, not to like bore you with too much live coding, I was going to show uh, service and events, which is a way to chunk data down in a, uh, inside just an HTTP call. That actually gives you everything you need once you move to HTTP2. So it's not something I've spent time developing yet, because 
Uh, once you have lightweight requests and response inside a single socket, which is what HTTP2 gives you, you actually don't need to drop out to a WebSocket layer. Like a WebSocket actually takes over the, um, the connection. So the problem of putting push information down has gone away. Several people have asked me about it. So it's clear that you know legacy systems just have WebSockets. Like there are clients that just expect WebSockets. Um, yeah, it's it's an open feature on that. Uh, if if we get uh, Cowboy support, then it'll it'll come out from that. Is there a good tutorial? Is there a good tutorial? Um, there is. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it, it's there's a Medium tutorial. The README for Racks is pretty helpful. Um, depending on how you want to go about it, um, actually just playing around with the generated project. So, um, yeah, the project that was generated is possibly the most helpful thing to look at in some ways. And, you know, you can try the various flags. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the, the getting started, as, as, as with all these things, like, you know, there's only so much manpower I've got, so contributions on documentation are always welcome. But yeah, if you want to get started uh, with the core things, documentation is very good. Uh, Rack session is the newest thing, and that's probably got the shakiest documentation. Thank you very much. Cheers.